Okay, Mike check one, two. Checks only at this register, cash only at this register. Good morning, everybody. It's Mark, your humble instructor. And today we're going to cover chapter three, security. It's about 90 PowerPoint slides on a slide deck. And then you guys are going to do on your own the lab 3.8.8. On You can do this on a Windows machine. You can actually do it on a Mac as well. Uh, the instruct instructions assume the lab report assumes you have a Windows machine. But you're going to go to wireshock.org and install the Wireshark program, which is a free open source program. This is a great pro program, a packet sniffer program that allows you to uh, um, uh, go and look at packets and see all the OSI 7 layer models and all this stuff that's built into there. Okay, let me see here. I need to share. And uh, this is the module we're going to cover today. Module three, chapter three, covering security. And the lab for this particular chapter is the lab 388, looking at DNS type traffic. There's a lot of security concerns about the old DNS. Uh, there's a new security DNS that's being made available. So uh, let's see, I will stop sharing this and start sharing this. Okay, and here we go with a wonderful why the world of security. <clears throat> Just checking to see if I can advance the slide properly. Okay, let's look at some uh, terms here. Um, uh, he talks about assets, uh, sometimes called the corporate estate. This is our computer equipment, the corporate knowledge of our people, um, all the data that we have accumulated. is something that has value to us, and we want to keep it, and we don't want to give it away to the competition, and we don't want ransomware people to come in and encrypt it and hold it for hostage. And particularly these days, the ransomware guys are doing really sneaky things. They'll ransom, they'll encrypt all your data. And then if you're like a medical industry where you have certain privacy laws, they'll say, well, if you don't pay us the ransom, not only are we not going to give you your files back, we're going to release all this information to the public, like who has mental health disease or something like that. And so this is, a, this is bad for these uh, Sarbanes Oxley and HIPAA and here in education, the Family Privacy Act. We've got to protect our data. Okay, a vulnerability is a vulnerability is a weakness or a flaw that allows um, allows someone to figure out what the uh, what this vulnerability uh, uh, how it is vulnerable, how it is a weakness, how we could exploit that by making a threat. So, for example. Um, um, Oh, I wrote a lab once about the Windows 2000 program. I'm really dating myself. That's a very old program. Uh, there was a vulnerability in the Windows 2000 program, Service Pack 3, that you could go into um, the administrators group and put your own arbitrary username in there. And that's really useful if you're the real administrator and you've got the password. But if you're a bad guy, that means you could go in there and get administrator access to the whole system. Uh, so there was a program written that's still out there called Metasploit that uh, you just point to the IP address of the Windows server and you say, I want to put a user in the administrators group and you could click it right in there. And Windows fixed that with Service Pack 4 for Windows 2000. But there are other vulnerabilities that are out there. So a threat is a danger. A threat is like someone gets the Metasploit program, a script kitty gets the program, and um, uh, they can threaten the system using an exploit which is a mechanism that, for example, a buffer overflow, a lot of code, particularly Windows code, it's not that well written. And you could go in with an exploit and overflow a buffer and put arbitrary lines of code that are executed by the machine that uh, then you could go and do things like erase the data or put your own users in there. Okay, mitigation is like 
buying insurance. What are the chances that your car is going to be stolen? Well, you're going to buy insurance to mitigate that threat. So a mitigation is something that we do uh, like intrusion protection systems or antivirus softwares or passwords that are long and difficult to remember or guess um, that tries to lower that risk. So the lawyers in the company are going to tell us we have to take two due diligence to mitigate these risks. Uh, some things are too expensive uh, to do, and we're just going to accept the risk. So the risk is a likelihood that someone might come in and get to an asset by exploiting some type of vulnerability that's in there. And this is going to be bad for the company, bad publicity. Think of Equifax, which I call Equihacks. About a year ago, it came out that they had failed to patch their Apache Windows Server software, and the bad guys were able to get in there and, and steal important data like people's social security numbers. So vectors of network attacks, a path through which someone can get in. So in the old Windows 2000 software, there was a path you could go in by coming in and performing a buffer overflow and beginning access to the machine and compromising that internal host machine. Um, ironically enough, we must protect ourselves against the outside people like the, oh, the, the, the our competitors or the black hat guys. We have to worry about our own internal company as well, about our own employees that have an agenda or maybe there's someone, a corporate spy that got hired in the help desk and they're working inside. So we have to have security both, both inside and out. So data loss. The ransomware guys encrypt your data so you can't get your data anymore. Or they exfiltrate it out where they leak it to the outside world. Hang loose, I'm just checking attendance here. Um, Okay. So in the business world, if you lose data, like look what happened to Equifax. Um, they had a loss of reputation. Their brand name was damaged. They lost competitive advantage. Not too bad for them because there's only really four big credit reporting agencies. Uh, you could, uh, in this case, uh, we're not the customers. We're the product. They're customers of the businesses that get credit reports from us. Um, that you could lose revenue and you could get sued. People have sued Equifax because their personal data got out there. Um, so it's our job as network engineers and security professionals to um, try to mitigate these losses and protect the reputation of the company. Okay, so email, social networking. Um, uh, you could send an instant message on oh, Facebook or something like that and it could be captured and reveal something about you. Uh, data that is sent over a network that is not encrypted is pretty much anyone can get a free copy of Wireshark and see all this data. Uh, for example, the Telnet protocol that we use to log into a remotely a switch or a router is totally unencrypted. Uh, it's be better practice to use a secure shell, which encrypts the data. Everything is in the cloud now. You can encrypt data that's in the cloud. So data at rest in the cloud server or data that's moving from point to point, uh, if it's encrypted, has weak security settings, uh, it could be lost or it could be uh, revealed to other people that should not be able to see it. USB drives. I know there are some companies like defense contractors that shoot hot glue in the USB port so that people can't plug in a USB drive and take it out of the building. Um, Another trick that the bad guys use is they'll scatter a bunch of USB drives in the parking lot. And what are you going to do when you see a USB drive lying in the parking lot when you come to work? Why, you're going to put it in your pocket, bring it into the building, plug it in, see what's in it. It's probably got a tape, piece of tape on it lab, labeled salaries to pique your interest. But what it's really got in it is some type of a virus or something that's going to go in and take over your company's machine. So you kind of got seduced into plugging that in. They couldn't get into the building. They don't work. They don't have a card key. Um, hard copy, like paper copies, uh, ought to be shredded. Uh, don't just throw it in the trash or throw it in the recycle bin. And if passwords are weak or easy to guess, that might be one way for a, a threat actor. We call them threat actors now. 
we used to call them malicious users or bad guys. They're the guys wearing the black hats and all the slides. Okay, so the black hat hackers, these are the bad guys that are trying to make money off of you by um, encrypting all your data and demanding a ransom to get it back. Um, gray hat hackers are the script kiddies who, they're not totally 100% above uh, 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 doing, uh, doing totally lawful stuff, but they're not there to steal your data or to hold you up for ransom. They're just trying to fool around with the system uh, to see what's going on there. The white hat guys, these are, Tarrant County College has got the white hat guys, which is our security team, that um, uh, we're trying to, we have the Family Privacy Act, we have to protect our data, we have to lock our data down. Um, they did a test on all the employees and faculty here and sent them a, a fake phishing email and one third of the employees fell for it. So now everybody had to take a phishing, anti-phishing course and uh, uh, to try to, you know, keep us from allowing someone to come in, an employee, click on the link, and it's a phishing link, and all of a sudden they, uh, somebody has got access to all our data that we're supposed to keep secret, like your social security number and things of that nature. Okay, script kiddies are usually people that are getting started. The hacker, the term hacker used to be a term of honor. It was someone that was so good with writing code in a few short, simple lines that us grizzled veterans would shake our heads in disbelief that this kid had written this great little line of code that did something so elegant and wonderful. But you've been conditioned by the press that a hacker is now a bad guy. If someone's going to hack into your system. Uh, script kiddies are not code experts. They just get a program off the web like Metasploit and use it. And it's just, you know, point and click. No programming skill required. Uh, we have vulnerability brokers that um, there are bounties paid by Microsoft and the other companies. If you discover a flaw in their code and report it to them, you can get paid. So a vulnerability person, a vulnerability broker could, could do something like this. Now, hacktivists are people that are they're activists, like a political activist with hacking skills. So they may, you know, maybe someone's got a personal agenda against Amazon. Oh, Bezos the Beast. Um, and they're going to use a distributed denial of service attack to slow down Amazon on Prime Day or during the Christmas rest season to try to slow them down. So they're a combination of a hacker and an activist. Uh, cyber criminals are working for working in large groups or by themselves. And of course, the National Security Agency leak of a few years ago, go, leaked a bunch of tools out that all the ransomware guys are using. So they're holding all these companies. Uh, they're encrypting all these companies' data, and you don't get the key back unless you pay them the ransom. And the bigger the company, the more money they want. And actually, it's ironic the 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 uh, 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 the, the, the guys that are uh, encrypting their data have better customer service than Microsoft because they want to get their money. Okay, state-sponsored. Oh, I think of, oh, North Korea, which supposedly did the Sony hack. It later turned out it was other people. But it's always easy to blame. Oh, blame the Russians. Blame the Chinese. Blame the North Koreans. Okay, blame all these communists for doing this stuff. State-sponsored stuff. All nations, all states have their own groups that are experts in this stuff because they're always constantly trying to get information from each other. That's what spies do. Okay, cyber criminals use, uh, uh, try to get into a company and do ransomware or something of that nature. Um, there's a big underground market in stolen credit cards. So someone puts a, a scanner device at a gas station and everybody that goes there for the next day or two that buys gas with their credit card or their debit card, they steal all those numbers and they sell them on the open market. And they have a good value in the open market, maybe $5 a number or something like that, until they get old and stale because eventually you're going to notice that your number, your credit card's got stuff on it. You didn't do it and they'll have to change your number. Hacktivists, Syrian Electronic Army, Anonymous. Um, uh, these are people who have political agendas. So they're going to use free tools, freely available tools, kind of like Metasploit. The 
the state-sponsored people are our deal. Oh, well, oh, he, he mentions the Stuxnet malware. The Stuxnet malware is widely believed to be of Israeli origin, and it was intended to to uh, shut down Iran's, uh, what do you call these spinners, these centrifuges that create uh, enhanced uranium. It got out into the wild, and now it's probably the one that damaged the, the Honeywell controller that was in, what was that place in Japan that the nuclear power plant had a flood and had a problem? Uh, it got out in, into the wild. And in the intelligence community, that's what we call blowback. Thank you very much. Yes, Fukushima, the power plant, which supposedly leaked and had a problem. Okay, we're not going to see the video because uh, ban, uh, Blackboard just doesn't have the bandwidth to share video over here. So I'll talk, talk to you about it instead. So um, you must have some sort of tool to exploit a vulnerability. The tools have become, oh, Metasploit is a great one to use. They don't require a lot of technical knowledge. So uh, a password cracker, sometimes they're called password recovery tools. Want a cracker, recover a password. Can you think of any legitimate use for such a thing? Well, what about if the guy who had the master password for the Microsoft Active Directory domain controller left the company, or maybe he left the company, he was mad, he changed the password on purpose. And now we don't know what the password is, and we need to continue to put new users in and reset their passwords. So we need to be able to um, uh, reset that password to something we know. This is kind of like password recovery on Cisco routers and switches. I don't care what the previous password is. I just need to be able to uh, change it to something I know. Uh, in the wireless world, we've got uh, Aircrack and the other tools that can listen, particularly if you're using all oh, the old WEP, wireless encryption protocol. No one should be using that. I call it weak encryption protocol. It's very easy to break that in about two minutes with one of these tools and then get you hack into somebody or use somebody's free Wi-Fi access. Uh, Nmap, uh, net scan type tools. Uh, example, Nmap is a tool that will scan a uh, particular host machine and see which ports are open and what you're listening. If it was a web server, like a server in a data center, it's listening on port 80 for incoming web requests for the company. It's listening on port 25 for email requests that are coming into that company. It's listening on port 53 if it's a DNS server. It's listening on ports 67 and 68 if it's a DHCP server, things of that nature. So someone that's scanning the company might determine that, well, this must be a ser server and I should try to break into this. If it's someone's workstation, they're not gonna be, workstations employ client machines, they're not gonna be running web servers. They won't respond to port 80. Uh, packet crafting tools are used to, to change the packet to try to get it, it would normally be rejected by firewall or an intrusion detection device. And in the packet sniffer world, Wireshark is the wonderful one that's totally free, open source. I love open source software that runs on multiple operating systems. Wireshark runs on Windows. It runs on Macintosh. It runs on Linux. And uh, it's a great tool for doing the stuff that we previously needed. When I was at Harkwood in the 90s, there was a $25,000 piece of hardware, a network sniffer called the sniffer. And it was in Orlando and I asked them to send it to me so I could use it. And no, they wouldn't let me use it. They didn't want me to let me use this tool. So today you could get a cheap two or three dollar netbook or laptop, put Wireshark on it, and you got yourself a portable packet sniffing tool for almost nothing. Okay, other tools, uh, rootkit detectors. Um, some, one of the ways, uh, an exploit is to come in and root your Linux or root your Windows and put something in that can't be detected by antivirus software. So root kit, root kit detectors can uh, can find these. Um, fuzzers, um, a scan a computer and, and determine what its vulnerabilities are. Um, now, uh, forensic tools, if a security violation occurs in a company, the security team is going to First of all, they're probably going to unplug it from the internet. And then they're going to go and use their forensic tools to try to find out what happened with that computer. And there are special tools like NCase that, that security people and law enforcement use to try to figure out what happened in that particular hard drive. They normally don't do anything with the hard drive. They normally clone it, and then they work on the clone, and they lock the original hard drive up so they can 
preserve custody, chain of custody. Uh, debuggers are devices to, to reverse engineer files. Uh, so uh, you don't have the original source code, you just have the, the object code, the binary code, and it can reverse the binary to the actual code that wrote it and give you a clue as to what's going on with that code. Um, okay, Kali Linux is a, oh, by the way, Kali Linux is kind of famous or notorious as a Linux distribution that includes a lot of security tools. Um, when we were still allowed to be on the TCC campus occasionally, when I tried to download Kali Linux, it would say, no, that's not, that's not allowed, that's prohibited. But Kali Linux actually offers a very nice introduction to Linux course, nothing particularly about security, but a good general purpose how to install and do a little bit of, of stuff with the Linux operating system using Kali. It's a free course, you can go to kali.org, K-A-L-I.org, and you can uh, uh, learn something about that. Uh, the Metasploit system was for many years put in distributions that had security tools because it's a it's it's a a tool that's good for us good guys. It also could be a tool for the bad guys. So we need to know what they're doing. Uh, encryption tools are tools that can uh, encode data. So uh, Open Secure Shell. Uh, he doesn't list the uh, uh, pretty good privacy. These are tools that you can use. We'll talk about keys. Uh, uh, encryption keys later, how they work. Uh, so you can encrypt the data, and, and if I give you the key, then you, you can be able to see my data, but nobody else would be able to see it. Uh, uh, vulnerability exploitation tools. Metasploit's the most famous one, where you can, uh, with very little programming ability, you can start hacking somebody just because you have a political agenda. And then vulnerability scanners look for open ports. So you can scan, so oh, he's got port 80 open there, he's running the old Windows Internet Information Services, that might be pretty easy to break into. Okay, here's some attack types, an eavesdropping attack, I'm gonna run Wireshark and listen to your traffic. Now, we're running a Microsoft network and it encrypts the passwords, you're probably pretty safe, but if you were running Telnet, hey, I can listen to the traffic and learn your name and passwords. Probably the same name and password you use everywhere else. Uh, data modification attack, I'm gonna get the data, what? Well, what if I'm going to the bank and someone's depositing $100 from my checking account to my savings account and I add an extra zero to it? Now I've got $1,000 instead of $100. Uh, do you think the banks want to stop something like that? Yeah, they have good security. Chase has excellent security. Uh, spoofing attack. I'm going to change my IP address to something else. In the Internet service provider world, they always filter the private inside addresses, 192.168, 172.16, 10 dot, because people will try to spoof their IP address. Oh, for example, Tarrant County College uses 10.144 for our South Campus inside addresses. So if I made spoof my address and change it to that from the outside world to try to break in, it would be accepted by the inside machines as a legitimate inside machine. Unfortunately for the hacker, the ISPs, we'll filter that, it won't go through. Now, if I can somehow learn your attack, learn your password, I could log on as you. And then I could get everything that you have been privileges, rights and privileges you've been given on the network. Okay, denial of service attack is designed to shut shut down the ability for authorized users to get to a system. Um, so for example, think of the TCP sync, sync, act, act. Uh, normally I send the sync as a client, the server responds with sync, act, then I respond with act, and I open a session with the server. What if I send a sync? and didn't respond to the SEC act with my ACK. And then I got 100 of my close friends to do the same thing. We've now tied up 100 incoming channels on that server with a distributed denial of service attack. The man in the middle attack, and I like to call this the monkey in the middle attack, is when I, for example, uh, use a DHCP fake server and change your default gateway from the real server, real router, to my machine so all traffic is routed through me and then now when you log into Chase Bank and put your password there or something, I've now learned that and I can uh, monitor all the traffic back and forth between you and the bank or whatever secure place you're going into. A compromise key is a key that is no longer secret. If I get your key, then I can see everything you can see. The sniffer is something like Wireshark. If they're not encrypted, or if they're, in, if they're encrypted and I have the key, 
I can see all the data. Okay, malware. Um, we have to worry about malware like ransomware attacks uh, in devices which uh, untechnically sophisticated uh, users, employees, normal employees that have no technical knowledge are using. Um, we, have to, we have to worry about those guys being socially engineered or being fished or something like that where they can break into the system. So viruses, Trojan horses, these are the things that infect the computer and then go through the network connection and infect other computers. So they can oh, delete all your files, uh, make your computer not boot anymore. Uh, these days people are interested in using your connection to the company server to steal information off the server. Once they've gotten into your PC, because you clicked on some dubious phishing link, they'd metastize like a cancer and spread out to all the other machines in the company. And then the IT security guys got to clean up the mess that you clicked on because you couldn't recognize it was a legitimate link. Boot sector viruses. The boot sector is the sector that when hard drives boot up, they go to a boot sector and then that tells it where is the operating system to boot up. You know, you can have more than one operating system on your PC. You can have Linux and Windows on the same hard drive. So the boot sector boots up and then it'll put up a little screen that says, do you want to boot Windows or do you want to boot Linux? You don't want to boot Linux. Uh, a lot of firmware read-only memory chips now are, are actually reprogrammable read-only memory chips. So the firmware would attack, the firmware attack would change the firmware on your PC. Um, the macro virus, the Microsoft Office macro feature, I've got that slideshow that I posted for that said OSPF Great Graphics uses Microsoft Office macros. They're disabled by default because people use the macro to come in and attack computers. So if you want to see the cool uh, init state, two-way state, uh, full state graphics, animated graphics on that slide, a Microsoft Office, uh, a Microsoft PowerPoint slideshow, you have to uh, turn on the macros and allow this. He'll warn you. Oh, warning, Will Robinson, you're turning on the macros. This is so unsafe. Uh, a program virus is a virus that inserts itself in one program and then appends itself, slightly increases the size of the file and then tries to get to other programs. And then script viruses, uh, uh, the operating system interpreter, which executes strips like a batch file or power, uh, not PowerPoint, uh, 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 the PowerShell program in Windows, uh, would go in and try to use that avenue to get into the system. So uh, remote access. Uh, there is a legitimate reason for a system professional. Let's say you call the help desk and he says, I need to get to your desk. Please click on the, this link we've installed on your PC so I can come in and remote access your PC and see what you're doing. Well, a Trojan horse might allow unauthorized people. There was a Microsoft thing. Microsoft had a program for many years called Back Office, which was a kind of a version of the Windows Server for small businesses. And there was a remote access authorized tool. It was called I'm sorry, back orifice. It would actually come in and give remote access, unauthorized access to users' PCs. Uh, data sending Trojan horses, send passwords, other information. Destructive Trojan horses, just delete all your data. Or maybe they'll just encrypt it and try to make you pay to get it back. Uh, a proxy Trojan horse will turn your PC into a zombie and once I get you and 10,000 of your closest friends zombified, I'm not going to use you to do through a chat channel to launch a denial of service attack against Amazon because I have a political agenda against them. Okay, FTP telnet, what's the problem with those? Oh, they're plain text. There's no encryption. So someone can easily get access to an FTP device and use it to Oh, in the 2000s when Microsoft Server installed the Internet Information Server, Web Server, and FTP Server by default, and people did realize it, they just wanted it to be a simple file and print server. So the uh, people that had stolen software would use your server as your company to store their, their wares, W-A-R-E-Z. Think of the Pirate Bay where you go to download copies of programs and music and movies that you didn't pay for. The, in the, term, the term for that is wares, W-A-R-E-Z. Uh, so I could store my wares on your company PC because you have a big hard drive and I don't. And then tell my friends where to download all my, all my illegal software. 
uh, other tri types of Trojan horses might stop an antivirus program because not only antivirus programs have a hook to go into the operating system and scan files, and so a disabler device could go in there and find that hook and stop your legitimate Microsoft security software or Kaspersky or Norton antivirus or whatever they were using. Okay, denial of service. We want to stop network activity. Sync, sync, act, act. Send the sync and don't send the act. Slow down that machine. Uh, key loggers, I'm mainly interested in learning your password. It's usually hidden on the screen. Or learning your credit card numbers. So if you ever go to ch carry a flash drive with your passwords in them and copy and paste them into the screen, do not type them. Or the key logger will record everything that you type on the keyboard. Okay, adware. Um, this is semi-legitimate. Semi um, uh, you, oh, let's see. You gotta, you gotta go to download a new version of Macromedia Flash, and he says offers to install something that's checked by default. That's a tiny file at the bottom of the page, and they install an adware on your machine. And now all your web browsers have this space at the top. And then as you get more of them, they eventually take up 90% of the space on your browser screen. And you try to close the windows when they pop up, and others pop up in their place. It's like the old Greek mythology, Hydra, you cut off one head and three others grew in his place. So you had nearly have to scan those with a, a, a adware remover to get rid of it. Okay, I talked about ransomware. The ransomware guys are very clever. They normally get into your system for a couple of months, they find all your backups, and then when they decide to strike, all the machines get encrypted overnight. All the backups are encrypted, even if it's a cloud-based service. And then you have to pay to get your data back. The only defense against ransomware is to have a good backup. And if they get your backup, you're stuck. My advice to you guys is protection against ransomware. Get a $50 USB hard drive. Use a free program like Macrium Reflect and eventually do a full image backup of your hard drive. Hicks rule of backup, as often as you care, or as seldom as you dare. And then when you're finished backing up, unplug that drive from your computer and store it somewhere. Then if you get hit by the ransomware, the drive's not plugged in, and you can just wipe the machine and uh, re-image it with whatever, whatever the most current version of backup that you made is. Uh, root kits are used to get to the root level of the machine, like uh, administrator root level access. <clears throat> Spyware is, well, what, what's a good example of spyware? How about Facebook? It's learning everything you prefer. Or Google, when you do Google searches. Uh, they're targeting what you like so they can give you targeted ads. Um, so, for example, Google will learn uh, whether you're a Republican, conservative, or a Democrat, liberal, and give you the appropriate types of ads and search with the results, uh, um, in other words, they track you like a dog. So as an alternative to Google, use something like uh, uh, Yandex or DuckDuckGo. They don't track you. They don't, they don't uh, try to figure out what you are. OK, a worm is a type of virus that uh, uh, starts uh, in one machine and sort of worms its way into the rest of the network. OK, we want to attack the network. And we're going to look at reconnaissance attacks, access attacks, and uh, okay, and uh, denial of service attacks. Okay, we can't see the video, but uh, what he's saying here is the steps that an attacker. If I was an attacker, I want to break into your system. First of all, I'm going to go to uh, the name and number authority, IANA type service, and figure out from your domain name for your company what your IP addresses are. And then I'm going to sweep, do a ping sweep. I'm a, the, ping, the pings that respond, I know you have active hosts at those addresses. Okay, so you come back with 100 IP addresses that are working for your company. Uh, the third step is I'm going to do a port scan. Well, I'm looking for machines that are servers that are responding to port 80 for web servers or responding on port 25 email. That's probably the main file server for the company, and it's going to have a lot of that stuff, device on it that I can, I can uh, help. Once I've determined the IP addresses of the juicy servers, 
Then I'm going to run vulnerability scanners on them, find out what version of the software they are. Because you can tell, is it a hardened Linux Bastion server? Or is it an unpatched old Microsoft server that's going to be easy to break into? And then finally, I'll run my exploitation tools like Metasploit and break into the system. So uh, reconnaissance attack. I want to do my information gathering. Uh, before I actually do the attack, I'm going to use that to find out. So I'm going to do, um, do a Google search, go to who is, find out what your IP address range is, uh, get a pro program that'll scan, you know, 192.168.1.1 to 100 or something like that, whatever your IP address is, and uh, then determine which IP addresses are responding. Then I'm going to port map, like in map, do a port scan of those IP addresses and find out which servers have, uh, which are probably servers. Then I run my vulnerability scanners and exploitation tools and, and try to break into your system. <clears throat> okay, no video. Sorry, bang with in the loud. So access attacks are trying to get through some vulnerability exploit. Oh, authentication services. Uh, Microsoft Active Directory, uh, Active Directory domain services as an authentication service that the college uses. Uh, FTP services for file transfer, web servers. I want to get get information. The, Met, the Equifax people got exploited through their web server and stole people's social security, social security numbers. Of all, all of us, uh, which we're not their customers, we're the product. So in a password attack, I want to, well, let's see, why don't I just try every possible password in the world? And eventually I'm going to find yours. So uh, there are all sorts of password cracking tools to do this. As system administrators, we normally do things like, oh, if you put in three incorrect passwords in a row, I'm going to lock you out for 10 minutes. Uh, in Novell Network, that was called the uh, 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 intruder detection. So that way it could slow you down. Uh, in a spoofing attack, I might try to pretend to have another IP address. I might to try to pretend to have another MAC address. I might pretend to be a DHCP uh, server. We're going to have uh, more on that later. Um, have you guys heard of Kevin Mitnick? He was the guy who got his start 20 or 30 years ago breaking into Kmart PA systems and saying amusing things over the system. He moved on to computers, hacked into a lot of computers. He was an excellent social engineer. He was a charming individual. So uh, a social engineer attack is something like this. You're at work and you get a phone call and the guy says, hey, it's Fred in the network engineering department, we fixed that collision domain that you had in your department, and uh, would you please verify your password so I can test that's working properly for your department? Now, it's not Fred from the engineering department. It's an intruder, but people just want to be helpful. And so, if you haven't been received the proper security training, what's the one of the first things that you get in security training? Never tell your password. Not even your boss. He don't need it. He'll just get a, his own rights and permissions to your files. But people want to be helpful, and now he's got your password. So pretexting. Uh, Fred pretended to be from the IT department of your company. He's not. got a phone list from the trash bin. He's calling people. He's eventually going to get the password from somebody. Uh, phishing is when you get an email, and it's got a link in it. it and it's, oh, you're Microsoft. Operating system has expired. Please click on this link. And they try to get your credit card numbers and other information. <clears throat> uh, spear phishing is typically targeted toward the financial people or the chief executive officers, the C-suite guys. They are normally, they know a lot about money, but they're usually pretty dumb when it comes to IT. So um, that way I want to try to say, create a fake thing that says, please authorize a $100,000 transfer from the accounts payable to this particular, actually a, someone that's stealing it, and it makes it look like it's real. Okay, spam mail, junk mail, Microsoft Office Outlook that we use does a pretty good job, good job, uh, job of uh, sorting out the spam and putting it in the spam folder. If you're using Google Mail or Yahoo Mail, they do the same sort of thing. Uh, quid pro quo. The threat actor requests something in exchange for something else. In politics, you think of quid pro quo 
where the politician in Congress says, well, uh, give me a project so I can put an aircraft plant in Fort Worth and I'll give you a project so you can build a $100 million bridge nowhere in Alaska. That sort of thing. Something for something. Okay. Oh, the baiting. Oh, look at that. Use a flash drive in a public location and then he brings it brings it into the company and, and injects some type of terrible virus into the company's uh, uh, network system. Impersonation, that's like pretexting, pretend to be somebody they're not. Uh, tailgating, uh, a lot of companies have a card key locked doors. So you go down to the entrance and they're all standing out there smoking and because they can't get out a lot of smoke in the buildings for 30 years now. Uh, so you just wait until someone opens the door and goes back in, you follow them in. They're going to be nice. They're going to hold the door open for you. <laughs> shoulder surfing is looking over someone's shoulder to see their password. So like when you type your enable secret password, it's not shown on the screen. They can't see it. Uh, when you type your Microsoft password in, when you come into the classroom, type your Microsoft password in, it's not shown on the screen. Uh, dumpster diving, I'm going to go to the dumpster behind the building, which is probably a non-secure area, and try to look for someone who threw out last year's phone directory. Because I want to call people and say, get the name, hello Susan, this is Mark from the engineering department. Get the names of real people to gain their trust. Okay, social engineering toolkit. Um, they did this to us. They gave us fake phishing attacks to see if we could detect them. Um, I remember one from our chief executive, chief technical officer, and it came out and was talking about um, uh, uh, e-physical education or e-run or something like that. This is not the sort of thing that the chief technical officer would send out a general mail to everybody on. He has sent out legitimate technical emails recently about how to work from home, how to install a uh, toolkit to get your home to connect to the college network. Okay, denial of service, I talked about distributed denial of service and denial of service. So I'm gonna get me and 10,000 of my close friends who I've zombified to try to all attack, oh, a company I, I don't like because I don't disagree with, I disagree with their political orientation or something. So we send a whole bunch of fake sync, sync act that are not complete and try to choke down that channel or take the packets and form them so that, for example, Microsoft servers, the older ones, um, used to expect the sync, sync act, act, and there were other there were other indicators there in the TCP header, uh, like FIN for turning the connection, uh, 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 urgent. They would use a Christmas tree attack. They would light up all six of those at the same time. They're never all six of them at the same time. It's either sync or sync act or act. And this Christmas tree attack just freaked out the Windows server and it crashed. And then I could do a buffer overflow and run my own code on that server. So the denial of service attack is one guy, but a distributed denial of service attack is when I'm zombified 10,000 home PCs and use them to attack somebody. Okay, IP attacks. Uh, we can't see the video, but I'll talk about them. IP version 4 and IP version 6. How does the I receiver of an IP packet know that the source address is actually correct. Uh, so a back guy doesn't want to give us real IP address. I can track him down, take him to court. So people that are trying to break into your system would try to use a spoofed source address. They have to use your, your accurate actual destination address so it gets to you. So internet control message protocol attacks, which is the mechanism behind ping. We're going to generate a bunch of pings or maybe try to generate the ping of death to every address of the company at the same time to slow it down. Amplification and reflection attacks. We want to use distributed denial of service attacks to slow down things. An address spoofing attack, I'm going to spoof the source address of a real address within the company. Well, most companies today are using private inside addresses. When I was at Harcourt in the 90s, we didn't do any network address translation. Every host machine in the company had a valid billable unique IP address. So it would have been easy to spoof and pretend to be the editor or something like that. Man in the middle attack is I'm going to get in the middle by pretending to be your default gateway. And then I'm going to eavesdrop everything because just like on a real router, the default gateway hears everything you do and all the replies. 
no, I'm hearing everything in all the replies. Uh, a session hijacking is I'm going to try to use a hijack a session, like a chat session or, or a Blackboard Collaborate session. See what's going on. Okay, Internet Control Message Protocol has legitimate uses. We use the ping part of it, echo request, echo reply. It's got a lot of other parameters that routers use to talk back and forth to each other and tell them that a network is unavailable or a network has come back on. So we can use access control list, which we're going to get in a, in a chapter coming up real soon now, to filter this type of stuff. Uh, we'll talk about intrusion detection systems, which are devices like Snort that look for stuff that doesn't look quite right and either quashes it like an intrusion protection system or sends frantic text to the network administrator, they need to come check this out. Okay, echo request and echo reply. Yeah, I want to check and make sure that uh, the device is working. Used by the bad guys to do denial of service attacks. ICMP unreachable, send a fake message. People can't get to the real server. IP, ICMP uh, mask reply, mapping internal networks. Uh, redirects, redirect that to the fake default gateway, which is my bad guy PC. And ICMP router discovery. We want to shoot some bad data into the router tables. This is a good protection against this, as almost every routing protocol has to have the ability to password protect it. And if you don't know the correct password, you ain't going to be able to put a bogus routing table in the router. Okay, amplification attacks. I'm the bad guy. I've zombified 10,000 home PCs because they don't have up-to-date software in them. And then I'm going to have all 10,000 of these guys attack whoever my victim of the day is. Okay, Facebook or Equifax or Amazon or whatever I want to try to break into. I'm going to try to slow them down. I address spoofing attacks is where I'm going to do blind or non-blind spoofing. Um, and then I'm going to try to maybe change the MAC address if I have access to the internal network. Because the MAC address is not significant once you get outside of the network. But many companies have VPNs now. For example, Tarrant County College uses a VPN to Blackboard when you're on campus. When you're off campus, you get the direct connection to the Blackboard uh, web server. Okay, here are the six Christmas tree lights. Of course, we have SYNC, SYNC ACK, and ACK. And there's the urgent field. It's like that foreigner song, urgent, urgent. Uh, oh, that's right. Curl ended in 1975. Uh, the push function and the fin function. So when you have sync, sync, act, act to start a TCD session, at the end of it, you have fin, act, fin, act, a four way teardown uh, so that the server is free to respond, uh, leaves the channel open for other people to connect to that server. So there are the Microsoft machines. The attackers would simply turn on all six of these at the same time. It would freak out the TCP code in the server. It would crash, leaving you with the ability to have a buffer overload attack and put your own arbitrary code to do whatever you wanted to on that server. And you didn't even know the password. So TCP, reliable end-to-end -end delivery. SIG, SIG, act, act, send segment number one, acknowledge segment number one, send segment two, acknowledge segment number two, uh, if there's anything lost, it would be retransmitted. Flow control is the ability for, oh, say the Amazon server on Prime Day is really, really busy right now. He can sort of put up his hand and say, hold it there. I'm going to help you out, but slower slowly than you are this time. And stateful communication is this sync, this acknowledge that takes place between the two parties compared to UDP, which has none of these features. UDP is like, I hope you can hear it. It's like TCP is like, when the IRS sends you a letter saying you're going to be audited and you have to sign for it and they know you got it, UDP is like when I send you a postcard in the mail. I'll never know if you got it or not, and you'll never know it's coming until it shows up that day. So TCP, SYNC, SYNC, ACK, ACK. This is a, establishes a session. Then we actually send the packets or the, the, the uh, segments, and each one of them is acknowledged. So in a sync flood attack, I would send a bunch of sync requests. And he's timing it coming out. He may only have 50 or 100 incoming channels capacity. And so if I fill them up, he cannot respond to legitimate users. I have 
denial of service to those other people with this distributed denial of service. The legitimate user sends this thing, and the web server cannot respond because the other, the other guy has, has clogged up all his channels. Okay, when we finish, we send fin, act, fin, act. That tears down the session. And so a uh, uh, bad guy could do a fake reset attack and then try to take over the session. Uh, session hijacking, uh, he wants to go as if he's already the host. Now, most home writers have pretty good defense against this stuff. When you do a sync, sync, act, act, the network address translation code in your router takes note of the actual IP addresses. And if someone else comes in and tries to take over, it doesn't match those IP addresses. And uh, he can't come in and get into your home system. Okay, user datagram protocol is the uh, lo-fi but very speedy version which when we can't afford all that overhead for TCD, like for streaming audio and video or telephones, it would slow it down too much. So in UDP, we just have a very simple header with the port numbers and the application layer data, like a segment of a phone conversation or a seg video segment. And it's up to the uh, two host machines, the server and the client, they're sending the data back and forth to handle any losses. So sometimes in YouTube, you get that scrolling circle thing uh, or in a voice over IP telephone, we don't need a lot of bandwidth, and we can tolerate a few packets being lost because telephone quality is pretty lousy anyway. So people will tolerate so long as they can understand what you're saying and they can recognize who you are. So in a UDP attack, um, there's no encryption. Um, so if I want to flood it, I might be able to, to uh, uh, send... ICMP port out reachable messages and try to slow your traffic down and keep you from getting to it. Okay, uh, ARP vulnerabilities. Um, ARP address resolution protocol is I need to learn another host machine's MAC address and I know this IP address. Now that other machine is either going to be on, within the VLAN of my local area network and I'll broadcast an ARP request out and he'll tell me what it is or if it's a machine that's on the other side of my default gateway, my friendly neighborhood router, my router will respond with his MAC address and he will relay the message for me. So there's something called an unsolicited ARP reply, called a gratuitous ARP. Gratuitous ARPs are evil and should not be configured in any system. Uh, so this means that anybody could send a fake gratuitous ARP and redirect you, a client employee workstation, to a bad guy system and and all the traffic on normally then would send to the default gateway router goes to this guy and he hears everything. ARP cache poisoning is every machine has a cache of recent communications and they store it for three to five minutes depending whether it's a workstation or, or a router or switch. So uh, a cache poisoning would, would use to kind of be the man in the middle, monkey in the middle tag and try to uh, change these uh, ARP cache to the bad guy's device instead of another one. Okay, DNS is not very secure by default. Uh, new secure DNSs are coming available. Here is the best advice I can give you with regard to DNS. Do not use the DHCP service and accept the normal DNS address that's given to you by your internet service provider. Uh, some of the cable companies in particular have been found that if you mistype, if you mistype Microsoft, for example, you'll get targeted advertising from their DNS servers. It's absolutely possible to click the top check mark box on your IP control panel and say, get the IP mass default gateway from the DHCP server. You have to have those. Click this checkbox underneath the DA DNS section that says specify manually and put in the easy to remember address of 9.9.9.9. .9 this is the Quad 9 project and it's a whitelist, blacklist project that filters out bogus, dangerous websites. And you can do that on Mac machines, you can do that on PC Windows machines. So if I can take over your DNS, then I can point to anything, and it could be a bad server. Okay, DNS cache poisoning attacks. I'm gonna, there's a DNS cache in your Windows workstation that stays active for about an hour, 
you can type ipconfig forward slash display DNS or clear DNS to clear it out. Uh, you, and if I can point your DNS and point to another device other than a legitimate server, then I can I can see your traffic. Uh, DNS amplification and reflection attacks are going to use a distributed denial of service attack on an open DNS resolver. The resolver is your workstation, not the DNS. The DNS resource utilization attack is going to also look for open resolvers and try to to corrupt the information that's in there. Fast flux, double IP flux, domain generation algorithms are things uh, that can, once I zombify your machine, I'm going to point you back to my chat server. And then when I'm ready to attack Amazon or Facebook because I'm a political activist or something, I can then use those to generate that attacks for them. Okay, shadowing attacks. I'm going to silently create different domains, and that way the actual owner of the domain probably won't notice. We hope that he won't notice. Okay, DNS tunneling. Place non-DNS traffic within uh, a little, uh, something that looks like legitimate DNS traffic. Most people's DNS servers are not that secure. There are new secure DNS features available. So uh, we can use recursive uh, Queries which query the upstream DNS server if we don't know it to try to, uh, to to learn a web server that's uh, just been recently been put on put on the system. So we have to use a filter that looks at that stuff. Uh, and the good quality firewalls can be programmed to check for this. Uh, Cisco Firepower, it's barely adequate. Cisco will practically give it to you because they're getting so much competition from the really good firewalls like Palo Alto or Fortinet. Those are the market leaders right now. Okay, DHCP servers. Uh, legitimate use. I'm going to flip up my workstation and he's going to send out the Dora discover request. Please give me my IP address. And the server, the DHCP server will respond. Here's your IP. Here's your subnet mask. Here's your default gateway. Here's your DNS server. Here's your domain name. Here's all your other stuff. Uh, so if I what if I brought a $20 Linksys router and plugged it into my office, into where my PC was located? It has a DHCP server. It could give up fake 192.168 addresses to other people in the building instead of the normal 10.144 addresses. We need to fix that. So there are some features in the Cisco iOS uh, DHCP snooping where we tag all the ports as untrusted that go to my desktop port in my office or trusted ports that actually go to real servers in the data center that need to respond to DHCP addresses. So I'm going to connect my rogue DHCP server to the network and give them a false wrong default gateway so I can intercept all their data. I'm going to give them a wrong DNS server address so that I, when you click on Microsoft.com, you're sent to our site. I'm going to give them the wrong IP address, and then you can't do your work. So if I can get my rough DHCP server to a switch port and I haven't configured DHCP snooping, it's off by default, then whenever a client requests a DHCP server, it, it's actually good practice to have two or more DHCP servers on the network in case one fails, the other one can give out addresses. You have to be careful not to give them overlapping addresses. So the client's simply going to respond to the first offer received. Now, the rogue offer will be responded to first because it's plugged into the same building that you are. It's not a couple hops away back at the Trinity River Data Center. And then the server gives up because he thinks another server's done it. And now I've taken control of your machine. Now, in the lab, you guys are going to configure Wireshark and look at some DNS trap. And the details for that are in the lab. CIA, not the Central Intelligence Agency. This is the information security. Confidentiality means once I'm logged into the system with my secret password, I am the only guy that can see that particular data, my private folder on the server. Nobody else can see it. Integrity means my data that I've saved, my company spreadsheet, is not hashed or messed up. Um, availability means I can get to it when I need to get to it. 
So if bad guys want to violate confidentiality by learning your password, then they want to violate integrity by taking a thousand dollars of your savings account and putting it in their account. And they want to violate availability by people from getting to an online merchant and buying things. So defense and death, I like to talk about this like layers of an onion. Um, let's do one thing and let's do another thing and wrap these each other. If somebody manages to get around one layer of defense, maybe the other layer of defense will stop him. Sure, we're going to do a naval secret class on the router. And then we're going to put a firewall around that. And then we're going to use long password freezers. And we're going to do all these different things so that it becomes more difficult for the user. Now think about the burglar that comes into your neighborhood. You've got great locks on your door. Your neighbor forgot to lock his door. Who gets robbed? Burglars are lazy. They're going to go to the easy door that opens up or the window that was left open and go rob that house. If you take extra layers of security with your house, he's going to not waste time with you. He don't want to get caught and noticed. He'll go to something that's easier. So in network security, the same sort of a thing. Uh, virtual private networks, firewalls, intrusion protection systems, uh, servers that uh, we don't have to do enable a secret class on our 300 routers when we change them. So we want to harden all the devices. We want to turn in what we call bastion hardened devices. And now when the data is, that, that is in rest is protected, data in motion across the links, we must protect that as well. So a firewall is essentially a service router. It has Ethernet ports to go back to the company network. It has Ethernet ports to go to the least line connections to the rest of the world. It allows legitimate traffic. Uh, in this case, this particular one has been uh, uh, programmed to allow traffic from outside addresses to go to the company web server so they can buy their products. It's allowing FTP traffic. It's allowing traffic to the mail server. It's allowing traffic to the uh, uh, IMAP so employees can pick up their email from home. Um, we're going to deny all inbound traffic with network addresses with our inside addresses. All ISPs do this. We're going to deny all inbound traffic to the server from external addresses. You must be on premises to get to the server. We're going to deny all inbound ping requests. Many companies have filtered ping, so you can't do the basic reconnaissance. Uh, Yahoo, I think Yahoo.com still accepts ping from home. Try ping Yahoo.com and see if you get an answer back. Deny all inbound Active Directory requests. You must be on premises. Deny all inbound traffic to the Microsoft database server with the student social security numbers on it. Um, deny all uh, local Microsoft domain, local broadcasts to go to the outside world. That might be one suggested configuration for a company to use. So intrusion protection systems, intrusion detection systems, are devices that tap into the network, they listen to all the packets, and they're looking for packets that something might be wrong with them. The most famous one is something called Snort. It was an open source product. It's been bought by Cisco now, but they still have the open source product available. And you put install the Snort on a workstation or server, and you haven't listened to all the traffic, and but here's anything. And there's a long list of Wireshark, excuse me, of Snort rules that he knows that, that are rules about things that are bad. And they're updated often. And so you can keep your device updated, kind of like in you know, the same scheme, keep your antivirus file updated with the latest signature. And uh, when something appears on your network that's out of, out of uh, ordinary, that could be bad, he'll detect it. In the case of an IDS, he will detect it. And he'll send an email or a text message to the system manager. Intrusion protection system will actually grab it and try to destroy it. So an intrusion protection system, the bad traffic comes in from the outside world, and the intrusion protection system determ determines that this is a bad packet, like a ping of death, and he drops the packet. Legitimate traffic would be on it. It's the wild, wild world of the internet out there. we got to be careful because anybody in the world can get on the internet. A Cisco email security device looks at email coming in and tries to look like if it's an email with a bad attachment or something like that, it'll place it in your, you know, uh, quarantine folder or something of that nature. Web security uh, appliance for web bets. Cisco has several products for these. Okay, uh, let me talk about cryptography. <clears throat> I want to uh, 
encrypt the data so that only the people who have the legitimate keys can get it back. Uh, or I want to encrypt the data so you can prove that it hasn't been tampered with. For example, you go to DistroWatch and download a version of Linux. Most Linux guys publish a, a hash of their product. So when you download it, you can run the hash on the download and make sure it matches what they publish. So to make sure no one's tampered with the file and it's going to really be a legitimate Linux install disk and not something that's going to put bad stuff on your on your machine. When we do the enable secret class, that's a hash. You type enable secret class. And then when you show run, it says enable secret it has a number five, which means it was MD5. And it has the encryption. It's very, very, very difficult to reverse encrypt that. Uh, encryption and cryptography uses prime numbers. So if I told you to multiply two prime, two digit prime numbers together, you could do that very quickly with a calculator. You come up with a you know a 20 digit product. If I told you here's a 20 digit product of two numbers, factor that into the two prime numbers that created that, that is math mathematically, that's very difficult. That's how encryption works, using prime numbers, large prime numbers, like 100, 200 bits. <clears throat> Origin authentication, we can make sure that it was a, not a forgery and it actually came from, so like hash message authentication code. Uh, confidentiality can be maintained because if I encrypt it and you're the only one with the key, you're the only one that will be able to see the, the original clear text that you see. Another way is non-repudiation. You get a message from your boss. Was it really from the boss? Well, I can, if he signed it with a, with a hash, I could check to make sure from his public key that it really was him. And then, since it really was him, he can't say, oh, that wasn't me. That was somebody else. That's non-repudiation. Okay, hash integrity. We want to make sure that message is not checked. The banks are very interested in this. I'm going to take $100 and transfer it from savings to checking. Well, what if I just change the 100 to 1,000? The hash won't match anymore. The bank will reject the transaction. And all these database transactions you do something about uh, commit and rollback. Either the transaction it succeeds as a whole and is committed, or if any problems occurred, it is rolled back if it never happened in the first place and the money doesn't change. If the hash doesn't match, it's rolled back. So MD5 is 128 bits. When you show, when you do enable secret class and show run, you see. Um, about 32 weird ASCII characters. You stick in the 128-bit um, digest and try and interpret it as a printable character on the screen. So you see those weird characters. Very, very difficult to reverse engineer those. Uh, SHA-1 is similar to MD5, but it's more bits, a little bit better. SHA-2 can be 512 bits. So we want to get ahead of the criminals who have advanced PCs that are much quicker than before and make it impractical for them to try to reverse engineer and break these codes. We want to make it so it would take them three or four years to do something, and we'll just change the code every day. So that means we're protected. There's no way they can get in. Okay, origin authentication. So if I hash something and then send it to you, and you've got the public key or the secret key, uh, you'll be able to prove that it has the correct hash. Okay, uh, let's talk about the difference between symmetrical and asymmetrical encryption. And I'm going to use an allegory here of the CIA agent in Moscow who's pretending to be a employee of the uh, uh, U.S. Embassy. So I want to send the secret microfilm to my guy in Russia. And before he left the country, I gave him a copy of a padlock key, of which I have two keys. So I'm going to place the secret microfilm in the box and lock it with my padlock and send it to him in Moscow, and he's going to unlock it with that key. That's the secret key. Now, if I hadn't given him the key in the first place, I would have to send him the box locked up and then mail the key to him. And the KGB would have simply steamed the envelope open and made a copy of the key, and they would have access to my data. So the problem with symmetric encryption is key distribution. We have to get it to you. How do you do this over the internet? 
and symmetrical, symmetrical encryption is much faster than asymmetrical encryption. Okay, let's use the CI, let's use the Moscow allegory. How do you send a key to somebody in Moscow when he's already in Moscow and I can't mail him the key? So I'm gonna go to the True Value Hardware Store here in Texas and buy a padlock and lock the box up with it and send the box to my guy in Moscow. My guy in Moscow is gonna to go to the Moscow True Value Hardware Store and buy a second padlock, lock up the box, now it has two padlocks on it, keep the key, mail it back to me. I will now take off my padlock with the key that I have and mail it back to him. It now only has one padlock on it, the one he bought in Russia. The CI agent in Moscow will now use his key and unlock the box. That's asymmetrical encryption. We had different keys to keep our data safe. So the way this works on the real web is when you go to Amazon or an online merchant or go to the bank, uh, I can't send the key in clear text form. So asymmetric keys are used. In a symmetrical key, the keys are the same. Whichever one encrypts, decrypts. So only one key. In asymmetric keys, there are two keys. If I encrypt with key A, only key B can decrypt it. If I decrypt, encrypt with key B, only key A can encrypt it. So with asymmetrical encryption, I'm gonna create a public-private key pair, keep my private key secret, not, 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 not secret, that's a bad term, keep it hidden, and I'm gonna publish my public key to world plus dog. So if you want to send me a secret message, use my public key and encrypt it, and only I can decrypt it because only I have the private key. So when you go to a web place uh, uh, that's an online merchant, there's an exchange of public keys, and this mechanism is used to send a secret and symmetrical key. So both parties have that, and then they'll switch to symmetric encryption, and the transaction will be very fast. So in symmetric encryption, it's a pre-shared key. They're both exactly the same. If I encrypt it with the key, I can decrypt it with the same key. Um, and you can make the key lengths any length you want these days. Not like in NT 4.0 in 1990 where it was 40 bits for Cuba. So uh, DES, triple DES, AES, SEAL, and the RC, these are all symmetric encryptions. In asymmetric encryption, this is called public key distribution. I'm gonna make a public key and a private key. I'll never reveal the private key, but I will give my public key to everybody. So we can use long key links, 1,000 bits, 4,000 bits. Shorter links aren't that reliable. This solves the key distribution problem. I don't have to worry about sending a secret key to you and somebody can get it who was supposed to get it. Anybody in the world can get my public key and they're not gonna be able to decrypt my data because only my secret key can. And then anybody in the world can send me data and safely encrypt it knowing that only I can take it back to the plain text to start with. So internet key exchange, secure socket layer SSL, sometimes called transport layer security, uh, and web pages. That's the initial sequence used on a web page when you go to Amazon. Asymmetric encryption is used to encode a secret key and send it to the server. And then now we both got the shared secret key, the processing is much quicker. Have you noticed when you did those labs with the switches in Secure Shell, that the very first time that you tried to log into the router of the switch with Secure Shell, it said, do you accept this key? You had to click on the OK button to accept the key exchange. Pretty good privacy, I mentioned that earlier. That's a program that you can use as an open source free program if you wanna uh, encrypt something and send it to somebody else without anybody else saying it, you can use pretty good privacy. So, uh, 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 Diff Diffie Hellman in the South, they call it Dixie Hellman, uh, DDS, DSA, uh, RSA are some examples of commonly used asymmetric encryption. Very good solution if you don't have a secure ch channel to send a secret key over. You can use this to create public private keys. So Diff Diffie Hellman, asymmetric algorithm. Thank you, Al Gore, for inventing this. Um, they want to generate an identical shared key and they never have communicated before. And the new shared key is never actually exchanged. So this is the means of using asymmetrical encryption to come up with a shared secret key. We don't wanna stick with asymmetrical, it's too slow. We wanna to go to shared secret key, it's much faster. <clears throat> okay, hey, all right. So um, let me stop sharing this.
Okay, so your lab assignment is to, and, and I want to get caught up here, guys. I think we can get caught up by the middle of next week back to our original, original schedule. Uh, we've lost a week here due to this extended uh, spring break thing. So please perform the lab 388. No packet tracing required. Uh, he's written it for Windows workstations. <clears throat> it will install on Linux machines. It will install on Macintosh machines and work just as well. Uh, most of you guys probably have Windows machines, so use that. Go to wireshark.org.org. Install the 64-bit version if you got Windows 8 or 10. Use the 64-bit version. And then follow the step-by-step -step lab procedure to uh, uh, do the DNS snooping on the package thing you're going to do in the particular lab. And then uh, do a save as, all caps letter, and send it to me, and I'll put it in your, in your MyTCC lab. Okay, guys, we've about come to the end of today's transmission. Uh, uh, please try to get caught up with your labs and reading. Uh, this session is being recorded, and it will be posted as fast as YouTube can process it. And I will put it in the uh, recorded lectures, recorded presentation section. Um, I have... Have our lab from last time. I mean, I have our presentation from last time, and it'll show up here as class session number two. After after that, it gets all processed. Okay, guys, thank you for coming today, and uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next Tuesday for class session number three. And this is Mark signing off.